When the dragon Smaug dies in 2941, the effects reverberate throughout all of Middle-earth, drastically changing the balance of power in the north. Today, I've put my regular research into action to answer the question, what if Smaug survived? While some would say the most logical point of deviation would be the moment Bard kills Smaug with the Black Arrow, Tolkien's own writings point to an earlier moment in the story with far-reaching implications. It is the spring of 2941 of the Third Age, and Gandalf is approaching Bree on his way to the Shire. He's going to the Shire for a brief respite after not having visited in 20 years. His mind is burdened, primarily with the presence of Sauron in Dol Guldur. A secondary concern is the dragon Smaug, in whom Gandalf fears Sauron may find an ally. In the actual story, Gandalf meets Thorin Oakenshield on the road to Bree, where they meet and discuss the state of things, including the dragon. Here is our moment of deviation. In today's scenario, Gandalf and Thorin, by being off by even just a day or two, don't meet near Bree. What is the impact of this? In short, it is very great. After the events of the Return of the King, Gandalf tells the surviving fellowship that the north of Middle-earth would be ruin and ash, but it was averted, all because he met Thorin Oakenshield one evening not far from Bree. In the canon story, Gandalf is able to convince Thorin of the futility of open war, as is stated in Unfinished Tales. Your own ideas are those of a king, Thorin Oakenshield, but your kingdom is gone. If it is to be restored, which I doubt, it must be from small beginnings. Far away here, I wonder if you fully realize the strength of a great dragon. But that is not all. There is a shadow growing fast in the world far more terrible. They will help one another. For Thorin, he makes his way back to the Blue Mountains, where, with no Gandalf to convince him otherwise, he moves forward with the plans he already has in mind. Plans for battle and war. Gandalf continues to the Shire, still in possession of the map and key to Erebor. In the canon story, it's only after his meeting with Thorin that Gandalf realizes who the raving dwarf was that gave these items to him. So in this scenario, he has no idea how significant these items are, or that it was King Thrain himself who gave them to him. While Gandalf is concerned with the threat of Smaug, he knows by now that the necromancer in Dol Guldur is Sauron. The re-emergence of the Dark Lord is the priority. So after a time of brief rest in the Shire as intended, he makes his way east in order to go through with his plan of convincing the White Council to attack Dol Guldur. Months later, in September 2941, Dol Guldur is attacked by the White Council, Gandalf having convinced the Council to act on the Necromancer. As for Thorin, he is still making battle plans. As we have seen over and over again in our videos on battles and wars of Middle-earth, most armies and conflicts are the result of years of planning. So Thorin is still in the planning phase as Sauron is displaced from Dol Guldur, making his way to Mordor around a week later. With no hobbit to rouse him and no dwarves to attempt to move against him, Smaug goes on living in his mountain. Now, what of the epic Battle of Five Armies? In short, there's no reason for these armies to congregate in this scenario. The dwarves of the Iron Hills are not summoned by Raven Messenger. With the dragon still alive, the elves of Mirkwood have no reason to leave their home. The men of Lake Town remain on the lake, and the goblins and wargs also have no reason to be there. Unlike it is portrayed in the films, the army of goblins and wargs does not come from Dol Guldur. In reality, the army consists of goblins of the Misty Mountains and Grey Mountains, commanded by Balg. These forces join together after Gandalf kills the Great Goblin, and after hearing of Smaug's death. With the Great Goblin and Smaug both still living, there is no reason for this vast host to assemble or march to Erebor. So let's take a look at the status of Middle-earth. Sauron has returned to Mordor, where his Nazgul have rebuilt Barad-dûr. Thorin is preparing for battle in the Blue Mountains. A vast force of orcs dwells between the Grey Mountains and the Misty Mountains. Smaug is alive and well in Erebor, and Gandalf and the White Council have won a victory by expelling Sauron from Dol Guldur. All the while, 
Bilbo Baggins sits in his armchair and the Ring of Power dwells in the depths of the Misty Mountains. Gandalf would no doubt still have concerns about Smaug, but at this point, it's hard to imagine him derailing Thorin's plans after months or even years of preparation, or to even know about them at all. Thorin marches his army of dwarves from the Blue Mountains, making their way to war. Messengers are dispatched to the Iron Hills in an effort to get reinforcement from his cousin Dane. By the year 2945, the army of dwarves marches upon the mountain. As Gandalf says in Unfinished Tales, I could see no hope in that. With no access to the secret door, the dwarves spill upon the gate of Erebor and are met with fire and death. Smaug, being now much older and stronger than when he originally took control of the mountain, devastates the army of Durin's folk. Those who survive retreat to the Iron Hills, utterly defeated. It is six years later in the actual story, in 2951, that Sauron sends three Nazgul back to Dol Guldur, where they begin rebuilding the fortress, and Sauron's influence in the north arises once again. With a dragon virtually in their backyard, Sauron sends one of his messengers as an emissary to Smaug, possibly a Nazgul, the mouth of Sauron, or some other servant. We can look to the messenger sent to King Dane as described in the Fellowship of the Ring for inspiration as to how this conversation might play out. The Lord Sauron the Great wishes for your friendship. Treasure he will give for it. Such treasures as he gave of old. Treasures far beyond the trinkets of the dwarves. In exchange for your service, Sauron shall give you lordship over all the lands of the north. All its people will pay homage to the great dragon Smaug, and his kingdom of Erebor shall overflow with the gold and jewels paid by his subjects. What say you? I say neither yea nor nay. I must consider this message and what it means under its fair cloak. Consider well, but not too long. The time of my thought is my own to spend. For the present, said the messenger, you have won a great victory over those who would steal from you, O Smaug. But think not there are no others in Middle-earth who would seek to usurp your wealth. Even now word of the attack spreads throughout the land. Perhaps there are those who believe they would fare better and with greater numbers. With Sauron as ally, no one should dare challenge the might of Smaug, King of the North. Convinced by the prospect of further riches, the rule of the North, and going forth unchallenged, Smaug agrees to ally himself with Sauron. An army of orcs is stationed around Erebor, attacking and enslaving the people of Lake Town in the process. Once again turning to unfinished tales, Gandalf gives us insight into Sauron's approach in making his war on the Free Peoples. With a dragon and a vast army of northern orcs at his command, Sauron first strikes not at the realm of Gondor, but of Lorien and Rivendell. It is likely that the woodland realm would be less of a priority for Sauron. For one, its leader is of lesser importance and unlikely to possess one of the coveted elven rings of power. Second, with the growing danger and presence of Sauron's forces in the north, Thranduil's people would likely retreat to the halls of the Elven King, which consists of a fortified system of caves. While this would enable them to hold out for some time during a siege, they also seem less of a threat to launch open war. Mobilizing the orcs of the north, Sauron takes control of the North Passage and begins re-establishing the realm of Angmar. Years later, Angmar has risen again. The army of Angmar, led by one or more Nazgul, marches south along the western side of the Misty Mountains. Meanwhile, a second army, led by Smaug, marches down the eastern side. We must keep in mind that with the One Ring still dwelling within the Misty Mountains, there is no journey to Rivendell, no Council of Elrond, and no Fellowship of the Ring. There is only separate realms of free peoples holding out for as long as they can against an army of orcs and a colossal dragon. Having become aware of the growing threat due to his regular visits to the northwest of Middle-earth, 
Gandalf arrives in Rivendell in hopes of assisting Elrond in his defense. With mighty enemies on both sides, Gandalf, Elrond, and the elves are far outnumbered and overrun. By the time the Fellowship would have formed, Rivendell is consumed in dragon fire and ruin. Encouraged by this victory and the riches it has won, Smaug, the Nazgul, and their combined forces prepare to attack Lorien, where Galadriel's strength will be put to its greatest test. Meanwhile, Gondor is still very much in a weakened state, likely battling the forces of the Witch King in the land surrounding Osgiliath. Rohan, for the past five years, has been under the control of Saruman through his servant Wormtongue. Saruman also commands an army of orcs at Isengard. Without Gandalf to free King Theoden of Wormtongue's influence, Rohan falls to Saruman with ease. Meanwhile, Smaug and the Nazgul lead the attack upon Lorien. How would Galadriel fare against this force? We learn in the actual story that Galadriel successfully repels the forces of Dol Guldur three times with her power. And later, after Celeborn and Thranduil defeat the orcs of Dol Guldur, Galadriel destroys the fortress on her own. However, let's not forget another event in the actual story, the Battle of Dale. In this battle, which takes place around the time of the Battle of Pelennor Fields, an Easterling army attacks the armies of Erebor and Dale. With no sizable force of dwarves or men remaining in the region of Erebor, Sauron instead sends these Easterlings to reinforce Smaug. The sheer size and power of this force behind the dragon would simply be too much for Galadriel and her elves to endure. Like Rivendell before it, Lorien burns and is no more. With Galadriel's defeat, following those of Gandalf and Elrond, Sauron now commands all three elven rings of power. So, at the uttermost end, Gondor stands alone. To the south are the armies of Barad-dûr, Minas Morgul, the Corsairs, and the Haradrim. From their victory at Lorien come the orcs of the north and the Easterlings. From the remains of Rohan rides the army of Saruman. With this massive force, Sauron utterly destroys Minas Tirith and enslaves the men of Gondor. Middle-earth is now under the dominion of the Dark Lord. Smaug returns to his mountain, his treasuries having grown immensely from his plunder of the Elven Realms, with promise of further reward coming his way from Sauron. With no realms left in the Northwest, the Kingdom of Angmar grows to encompass all of Eriador, including the Shire, where the hobbits are made into slaves. The few elves remaining at the Grey Havens, led by Círdan, sail to the west, forsaking the ruined world that was their home. While the world is under Sauron's control, and he commands his mighty lieutenants including Smaug, Saruman, and the Nazgul, he cannot fully rest in his victory, for the One Ring remains lost. For Saruman and the Dark Lord, the race is on. The first to claim the Ring will rule, with all of Middle-earth under his sway. Meanwhile, in the forest of Mirkwood, the last remaining group of free peoples prepares to make its final stand. As the dragon flies overhead, returning to his mountain, a man of Dale, shackled in servitude, looks up, dreaming of his chance to hold a bow once again. Well, there you have it, guys. There's my theory on what if Smaug survived. Obviously, there's a lot of speculation here, and there's plenty of room for other ideas and opinions. I'd love to hear what you think would happen if Smaug survived, so be sure to tell me in the comments. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters, including Gail Elizabeth, Jim Limber Davis, Tom DeBombadil19, Sky Carcass, Salim Rahman, Smorzerk, Matt Schultz, Zetrock, Gimelkod, Game Strategy Nerd, Debbie, and Chief40123. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.